There you are. Welcome. Kyle Brandt's Basements, last show of the week. Glad to have you here. Glad to hang out with you. So many things to get into today. We have a football game tonight. Week 7 NFL action. This is that time of the season people start saying, man, it's really going fast. I can't believe it. I feel like the season's already halfway over. I know. Enjoy it. You will enjoy that game tonight. You will enjoy that that Saints-Cardinals game. And you will enjoy... um, a lot of things about today's show. We're going to talk about all the quarterback storylines this weekend. The games, crap. Quarterback storylines, really, really good. We're going to talk about Arnold and Sylvester Stallone carving pumpkins together. Have you seen that pick? It's beautiful. And guess what? There's a new-ish Russell Wilson sandwich commercial. It's spicy. We're going to break that down as part of what's hilarious. Russell Wilson's got himself a game this weekend, too. All kinds of things we have to get to. And it takes on takes a new combatant. We have the usual. We got Marcus Spears. He's been there before. Mike Wilbon's going to get in here and fight? I like it, Wilbon. We're doing all kinds of things. But first, we're going to the Sky Cam. We're going to see if my unprecedented missed free throw streak continues. I'm a reasonably athletic guy, frankly. And yet, I somehow can't make a shot. I've missed like six in a row from seven feet away. Here you go. Ready? And I'm so in my head. I, I, I hear the crew no! rooting against me, and no! I think that's probably no! seven in a row. I just can't make it, and I make them all in practice. That's the story of my life. Guys, let's get to what I love, what I hate, and what's hilarious right now. I'm going to make a reference to Woodstock 99 because I really like the Ringer documentary about it that came out this year or last year. I thought it was just awesome. So Korn came on, and they are one of the most memorable performances outside of um, uh, Link, uh, outside of Limp Bizkit. Korn came on, and it was the Jonathan Davis, are you ready? And it's just insane. If you've never watched it before, watch it on YouTube. It was There will never really be a concert like that again with that kind of rock and that kind of aggression, and they just brought the house down and everything. And... People kind of remember, or at least selectively, or think they remember, that that was the last performance of the night. It's not true. After Korn came on and just screamed and thrashed and bounced sound waves all over the, the whole event, then they leave and Bush had to come on. Gavin Rosdale. And he walks out there, and they're a cool band and everything, but they weren't the same intensity as Korn. And he came out, and the first song they played was Swallowed, which is kind of an underwhelming song after their second album, Razorblade Suitcase. It was just like, man, Korn, hard act to follow. Why do I start with that? This is not a great selection of NFL football games we have for you this weekend. Last week was. (laughs) Last week was awesome. Last week is one of the biggest stories of the year, the Jets going to Lambeau and winning by 17 points. And it was the one that we've been waiting for since January. It was the Buffalo Bills and Josh Allen returning to Arrowhead. It was, I, I've called it Super Bowl 56 and a half. It, it was the one. It was the one we wanted. It was the corn set. It, it was everything. And now this week's games, this is Gavin Rosdale coming out there. And you're like, you know, come down from this cloud and glycerine. And it's fine. It's a tough act to follow. And yet, look at the front men. I'm not going to just completely crap on this whole week because while the matchups, you just scan, you're like, ugh, 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 including tonight, the, the quarterback storylines are really good. You look at the front men, the lead singers, really good storylines, starting with Dak. Dak's back! You know how much I love Cooper Rush? I would have been pleased if Cooper Rush played the next 10 years as a starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys. He went down in flames against the Eagles. So Dak is back against the Lions. They couldn't have planned it better. You get a home game to usher out your quarter-billion-dollar quarterback against literally the worst defense on earth. 30 seconds, can't stop anyone. They're off the bye week, so maybe they did some soul-searching or something. That soul-searching doesn't tackle people. It doesn't guard CeeDee Lamb and tackle Tony Pollard. I, I do think it's interesting. We were talking about this a little bit this morning. What kind of Cowboys do we get now with Dak? Is it going to be back to, like, is Dak going to throw 40 passes in this game? Is he going to throw 50? Or are they going to kind of pick up the really effective Cooper Rush Cowboys offense where they run a lot and just stay the hell out of Micah Parsons' way and let the defense kick ass? I would really like that. My dream stat line for Dak in this game as his return is 13 for 19 for 191 yards, two touchdowns, no picks. That's it. 13 completions for 191 yards. There's your big plays for sure. 
but I would just, I, I have this feeling that Jerry Jones wants a new unveiling and he was miserable during the Cooper Rush experience, even though they were winning because they weren't selling jerseys and moving merch and lighting the scoreboard up and all that. So I, I worry that it's going to be light them up, Dak, just go right back to the same Cowboys experience that we've had for years and years and go up and down the field and chuck bombs and oh no, he got strip sacked and the Lions are staying in the game. I just want the meat and potatoes Cowboys that we have with Cooper Rush with the slightly higher scoring total that we'll have with Dak Prescott. Just watch. I don't want the Cowboys to be drunk this weekend. Just be, just chill. Michael Parsons is your best player. Don't mess it up. Let him kick ass. You hand off and punt if you need to. Then you got Tua. Tua's facing the Steelers Sunday night. Tua's making his comeback. God, what a weird life for Tua. And I mean his football life. He went through this whole massive chapter where he looks like the truth at Alabama. He looks like he's going to be the next Steve Young. It's just incredible. And then he has this terrible and bizarre injury with his hip that sets him aside. And man, I don't know. He gets drafted really high, but I don't know if he has it. I don't know if he ever really recovered from that. He's a lefty. He's kind of small. Is this guy good? So finally, he gets the coach this year, and he gets great weapons, and he's just kicking ass, and it's all the tool we've ever wanted. He's 3-0. and And then kind of the terrible, morbid sequel to the hip injury is his head getting slammed on the turf and him getting carried off. So it's it, again, he just comes crashing down, and the Dolphins haven't won since. So I, I, Tua is unbelievably likable, and I'm totally into him, and I think he's different and fresh and fun and cool, just like his head coach is. But he just keeps having these hard luck injuries. And now, aren't you going to be scared watching Tua? I, I mean that. If you watched him in that game against the Bengals with all the crazy stuff that he was doing and the really, really abhorrent look that he had after he got hit down, when he takes a hit, aren't you like, oh, crap, oh, please, please get up. I'm a little nervous watching it. It's not a fun feeling, but I want to see how he bounces back. I'm telling you, the quarterback storyline is great. Tom Brady going against the Panthers. Perfect timing. I saw Brady just gave a press conference in which he opened it by apologizing for comparing the football season to military life with being deployed. Um, so he, he had said that, you know, he was talking to him on his podcast about when you go out and to start the season again, it kind of feels like you're deploying in the military. I'm paraphrasing, but he used the word deploy. So he starts today his media session saying, I apologize, poor choice of words, which I, I think is, you know, appropriate and that's fine. I I think it was he was he should have said that. He said it like he should have. My problem is, um, does he beat the Panthers this weekend? Right? The Panthers are the worst team in the league. Terrible. They got they fire their head coach. They kick their wide receiver off. Uh, Baker Mayfield. It, it's just it's all completely gotten away from them. So it's the perfect timing. I'm sure the Buccaneers will win. But Brady, what a weird week. What a weird week. And you see the Kelsey boys talking about. They were talking about um. You know, it's, it's Brady yelling at his linemen, and if they would stand for that, and Travis gives him a pass because he's Brady, it's that, it's the off-the-field stuff, it's just everything. Brady just needs a calm week in which he smiles and does his dumb jokes afterwards, and he throws for three touchdowns to Mike Evans, and they win. We'll see. Zach Wilson versus Russell Wilson. The Wilson Bowl. Wilson, the volleyball. We'll talk about Russell Wilson in a second, believe you me. You know, the cool thing about the Jets, I guess it's cool, is that they've gotten out to this great start and they have a good record and they just won in Lambeau. But Zach Wilson, we don't really know if he's good. We're not sure yet. He hasn't had the moment. It's They win in a different way. They win with the rookie running back and the receivers make some plays. But like last week, against, they went on at Lambeau, 17-point win, and no Jet caught more than two passes. He only threw a handful. He had like a high school stat line. I don't have it in front of him. It's 115 yards or something like that. Just completely pedestrian. Not going to win a lot of games like that. So is this the time? We ever going to have a Zach Wilson game? Is he going to start chucking it one of these weeks? I'm like, wow, this, they're more than just a cool spirited team behind a great head coach who starts off with a nice record. Their quarterback can really play too. That would be fun. Um, speaking of New York quarterbacks, understand that I really like what the Giants are doing and I'm really appreciative of it and it's fresh and it's fun and Dable and Saquon and everything. I'm hearing and I'm reading online that people are already pushing for an extension for Daniel Jones. And you got to be kidding me. Easy. Easy. Understand the situation here. All right, the Giants did not pick up his fifth-year extension. So this is his last year contractually with the Giants. In order for him to be on the Giants next year and years moving forward, it's going to take a lot of money. A lot. Franchise, long-term, whatever it means. A ton of money. Do you understand that an extension for Daniel Jones is a long-term extension, multi-year, 
his agent is going to say, great, we'd love to sign an extension. I've been telling you about our, my kid for years. That's 30, 40 million dollars a year, not 30. I'm talking 30s, high 30s, 45, 42. Like that's just what you get now. It doesn't matter that he's nowhere near close to other guys who are making that money as good. That's what you'd be paying him. So I don't really want to spend a lot of time here doing contract minutia and splitting hairs about that. All I'm saying is Daniel Jones has been fine this year. He hasn't made a big mistake. He runs really well sometimes. He's throwing a few good passes, but you guys are already saying extend him. You want Daniel Jones for the next three, four, five years. Are you crazy? Don't do that. There may come a time and we see another month to six weeks of Daniel Jones football and holy crap, he really has turned it on. And this guy's grown up right in front of us. But don't confuse their record with Daniel Jones' case for a massive, massive salary cap straining contract. We, we, we're not even going to talk about the Saquon extension yet because that's going to be the same thing. I don't think they should do that either. But easy on the Daniel Jones. I think by far you should not do it now. I don't even know if you should do it at the end of the season. They finish 10-7, and seven, they lose in the wild card game. Really nice season for the Giants that no one expected. You don't just say, Daniel Jones, you were awesome. Here's all the money. We're, we're going to completely handicap ourselves in the salary cap and in the quarterback position for years to come because we got an awesome coach and won some games. Easy on that. Easy. Don't do that yet. Stop. I'm hearing people are calling, they're tweeting, extend him now. Chill. I like the quarterback storylines, but let's get into something completely different, and that's what I hate. So I mentioned this Sunday Night Football, the uh, Dolphins versus the Steelers. And if you do the math, it is 2022, and 2022 minus 50 is 1972. And that brings us to the 1972 Dolphins, who are going to be honored in the Sunday Night Football gathering, the game. The, they're going to honor the Dolphins. It's the 50th anniversary. I don't know if you know this, but uh, the Dolphins in 1972 had a perfect season in which they didn't lose a game. Just ask them. I hate their act so much. I hate it. Hate it, hate it, hate it. I don't have any problem with them going undefeated. It's actually, it's really cool that they didn't lose any games back in 1972. That's a tough time to play football, man. The goalposts were on the goal line. There wasn't a lot of uh, sophisticated trainers, doctors. It was tough. It was physical. The equipment was insufficient. And they had a season, one season, 1972, in which they didn't lose any games and they won the Super Bowl. And that is really cool. I like that. How could you not? But I hate what they have done in every waking moment since then, in which they have openly and unapologetically rooted against teams doing what they did and celebrated when they've come short of doing that. It is so Bush League and it is so pathetic and we've seen this for years and years and years. A team starts out really hot. They get to 6-0, 7-0, 8-0. And right around that 9-0, 10-0, somebody runs down one of the 72 Dolphins and gets their thought, hey, what do you think? These guys might go perfect. And there's always a quote and there's always this quippy little line. And then sure enough, when that team eventually loses, let's say they're a 12-0 team and they lose to go to 12-1, there is a shot, like the ones we're seeing here, of members of the 72 Dolphins with champagne openly celebrating another team losing, and I absolutely hate it. I hate it. I think it goes against everything that we should be about in sports, as athletes, as coaches, as bleeping human beings. It is such a terrible look. It is so pathetically Uncle Rico celebrating your past that you don't encourage teams to do what you did. Root for them to do as you did so they could have that great experience that you had when you were a younger man so that the league could have that so that young fans could see a perfect team so that those teams family members could go through a perfect team everything you got to do 50 years ago not only are you kind of secretly saying man this is cool this was our thing I hope no one does it you're waiting for the nearest local television camera and popping champagne to say hell yes they lost we're still the best. And you're not the best. You're not. 
You know, a perfect season, it's a whole different discussion, and I have a fe- pretty good feeling that certainly all the Steelers teams in that decade and maybe every other Super Bowl team would have waxed you guys if they played. But that's besides the point. That's gratuitous. Um, I have a lot of thoughts on this because I've seen it for so many years. There's always the thing where they start talking, like I mentioned. And this really got big back in the 18-0 Patriots team that eventually ended up losing to David Tyree and Eli Manning. And all these 72 Dolphins were everywhere. And I don't blame them for showing up to doing media or showing up and talking and talking so they could go to the local car dealership or the tire store and collect the check to sign autographs. That's fine. But the quotes that would come out of these guys back in the day, I remember the season really well. This is the Patriots, Randy Moss, Wes Welker, all that. And they were the biggest threat ever in 50 years, or at the time, it was around 40 years, to the Dolphins' whole reason for living, which is they didn't lose any games. And Mercury Morris, their running back, who had played next to Larry Zonka, would go on every show and every Sports Center deal. And he would say things like, well, the Patriots are 9-0, and Mercury, what do you think? Don't call me when you're in my town, call me when you're on my block. And when I see you next door moving your furniture in, that's when I know you're going to the championship. And if you win it, I'll be dressed up in a tuxedo waiting on my bride. So he's doing kind of a pro wrestling thing. And, you know, again, he wants to get the local endorsements and get on TV, and that's fine. February 1st, two days before the Super Bowl, in which the Patriots were going to go undefeated, Super Bowl 42, if they could just beat the Giants, Mercury Morris... We'll be 1A and they'll be 1B. They'll be like our little brother. It's just always so crass and unfunny and stupid and unencouraging and classless. I hate it. Um, There's another player, Bob Kuchenberg, who was guard on that team, on that Dolphins team. And he was asked, how important is it for you guys to continue to be the only team? This is, again, before the Patriots Super Bowl. It's terribly important, he said. The same passion that flowed through our bodies 35 years ago is still with us. It's thrilling for us to still be alone in Perfectville. Pathetic. Pathetic. Um, Don Shula, respect everything that he stood for, was asked before that same Super Bowl how he'd react if the Giants were to upset the Patriots. I'm going to be at the game and I'll be jumping up and down. Why? Because the Patriots lost? It was a really cool team. They worked really hard. They put in a lot of sacrifice and went through a lot of stress week after week and month after month to win every game. And you're going to cheer because Bill Belichick couldn't win as perfectly as you guys did? I'm not even going to try to come back and tell you that they actually went 18-0, and which is more games that you guys won in a row because it was a shorter season. I don't even need to put that. I just believe in it. I, I, I believe in saying, wow, I did something awesome back in the day when I was a younger man, and now I'm a little older, a little slower, and a little pathetic, and I see that someone else might do it. Do I sit there and silently hope they don't so I could have my moment still just for me? Do I go on the radio and loudly say I hope they don't so I could openly discourage them, or do I say... You know, the game's passed me by, and I had a wonderful time when I was a young man, but I really am hoping that these gentlemen have my experience, because it was so wonderful for me. I would love to share it with someone. Let me just throw these out. For all the 72 Dolphins who continue to pop the champagne, like a bunch of, I'm not, I can't even use the word. Some other examples. Russell Westbrook was going to break the all-time triple doubles record, which he did. Oscar Robertson, big O, openly rooting for him, which you should do it. Roger Maris, we just saw this with Aaron Judge. Roger Maris Jr., the family is traveling around, offering encouragements and congratulations. Imagine if Roger Maris Jr. was going on the WFAN, whatever, saying, man, if he does it, he'll be my dad's bride, and he'll be 1B. It's pathetic. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar has tons of records and always cheers when they're broken. Kareem has said, when I see these talented veteran players, remarkable athleticism while shooting, blocking, and rebounding, I'm cheering them with, I'm cheering on with them. Go, man, go. I want them to break my records because doing so is one more benchmark of human progress. That's how deep Kareem with it. You can keep going. Wayne Gretzky has openly said that he hopes Ovechkin breaks his career goals. Gretzky's all for it. He's the great one. Gordie Howe had said the same thing about Gretzky. See how this works? Old people, young people, it's nice people, it's smart people, it's gracious people. Phil Jackson, they said, oh, the Golden State Warriors are incredible. You guys won 72 games, I might win 73. Great, I'm all for it, I hope they do it. Steve Kerr, one of my players on that team, it would be fitting. Steph Curry is a great person and a great ambassador. I hope they do it. Imagine if he just said, yeah, they'll be our bride. Pathetic. 
Pele has openly said that he wants his goals record to be broken. It, it goes on and on. We can go outside of sports. Ken Jennings, remember him? Remember he was the all-time great record that he's the host of Jeopardy right now? And James Holzhauer was going to break his all-time winnings record. Jennings is talking to anybody who's listening. James is a great guy. He's a great ambassador. I love this. Root for him. That's what you do. So you're going to see these old guys who had a great season, which I respect, and I have no problem with them being honored for having a perfect season 50 years ago. What I have a huge problem with is them celebrating everyone else's imperfect season 49 through 48, 47, 46, one year ago. It's what they do, honestly. It is so lame and so pathetic. For a guy, a group of guys who are known as prolific winners, they are such losers. I hate that. And they'll show it and they'll celebrate them and everyone will laugh about the champagne. It's not cool. If you have kids like I do, show them on Sunday night when they do the champagne thing. That's exactly how not to act. Great season a year ago. Don't take anything away from you. I hate how you take everything away from everybody else. That's what I hate. Let's get on, though, to what's hilarious. Well, we got another one. We got another uh, Russell Wilson sandwich commercial. And you know the last one where he's standing there and it's... I think it was PFT commenter who put it perfectly. He's just talking like a serial killer who's speaking to someone who he has tied up and bound and gagged the whole time. It's that, be careful though, it's spicy. You ever do anything dangerous? Oh wow, that is dangerous. I mean, I can't believe that it actually got through final approval and they said, yeah, release that to the public. Well, apparently there's another one that's been out for a few weeks, but a lot of people haven't seen, I haven't seen, I saw it online today and I'm just gonna roll it. Let's just let's just watch it and remind ourselves that massive company, massive athlete, a lot of people in the room, a lot of opinion makers, and a lot of people came to the realization that they had made the greatest commercial and it should be released, and this is what they decided. Here are all the dangerous ways. Danger witch. I call this one. I call this one the blind. Uh oh. <laughs> Big bite. The drop. Right. The left hander. <laughs> Wielding. Upside down. Here comes the airplane. Mm hmm. And the most dangerous of all. The rapper. Just don't eat the rapper on the bottom. Okay, um, that's the danger witch. Let's go to the sky cam for a second. I just have to take a little breather. I have to kind of cleanse the palate after that. Things get a little dicey in the basement sometimes because I threw a dart. Here it is. One of the light covers went missing and I'm gonna replace it right now, I think, because I was so upset about the commercial. Dang, I don't think I can do this. Now I'm gonna burn myself on the light. No, it's just gonna have to stay off. I'm ex I'm about a three on the DIY scale. Wait a sec. Yeah, kick me up to a five. All right, I fixed the light that I hit with a dart because I was so thrown off by the danger witch. Um, listen, I don't I don't think I don't think it's a terrible commercial. They had the idea that there's all these you know dangerous ways to eat a sandwich. It's fine. It's okay. Knife and fork, upside down. I just have some questions. Like that outfit, if if you're listening rather than watching on YouTube, is did Russell wear that in? Is that his personal wardrobe? Because I have a feeling it is. It's a leather jacket, it's fingerless gloves, it's the aviator shades, and it's like a beanie cap. And I feel like they had a bunch of wardrobe picked out and Russ just walked in like that. And they're like, oh well, you should just wear that if you're comfortable. And that's great. That looks really good. That it looks like a Russell Wilson outfit. I wouldn't be surprised to see him wear that at the game this weekend. And then I think the bigger point is that if the Broncos right now were five and one or six and zero, oh, that works. Everybody's going out and getting danger witches. They're just doing it. And maybe they eat him with a knife and fork, or maybe they try the different ways because Russell Wilson is so good, and the Broncos are awesome, and they're just winning. The Broncos are an embarrassment, objectively. 
the head coach, the quarterback, the record, everything. And so what happens with these sports endorsement deals, I, I, I've, I've thought this for years, is that they're all shot in the offseason, right? So, you know, Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, all those guys shoot their commercials over the summer, and then they just air for the whole football season. So in giving them all that money and shooting those commercials, these insurance companies and sandwich companies are really making a bet that they're going to be good and their seasons are going to play out and also that they're not going to be injured because it looks really bad when the player is terrible and the team is terrible, but you've already spent all this money, so you're going to continue to release, air, tweet, and share all these videos of them acting ridiculous and doing a baby voice and saying, here comes a sandwich. So I remember it used to go like this. Um, maybe 15 years ago, Blake Griffin came into the NBA. And Blake Griffin would always make really funny commercials. Like he was a breath of fresh air. He was, he was dry and he was funny and he was witty and it was great. But then they would always have the story where the Clippers wouldn't make the playoffs and the Clippers would always fall on their faces. And then the Blake Griffin commercials would air through the NBA playoffs because clearly Kia or Saturn, whoever the hell he was induce, endorsing at the time, um, had paid for playoff shots. So you'd watch it and like there's Blake Griffin every commercial break while it's the Celtics or the Lakers, and it was just kind of embarrassing and a little pathetic because he wasn't even in the playoffs, but they'd still be airing this commercial. That's the kind of vibes I'm getting right now from the Russell Wilson is that we're seeing him, you know, tell us the different ways to eat sandwiches and he can't even score touchdowns. Like, show us the different ways you can get the ball in at the one yard line, Russ. I'm fine, I know how to eat a sandwich. I don't need your jokes about the danger witch. It's just bad. It's a bad, bad look on the heels of the one before where the guy's tied up and he's a serial killer. Now we have him come in with the aviators and do this. And it's just, listen, I've said a lot of things about Russell Wilson, of which I regret none about his inauthenticity, um, about how I don't think he's a genuine article and he's trying to be something he's not. And then when you take them to a commercial set, remember this, um, you know, no matter what you do for a living, if you are a realtor or the president or a movie star or a sports broadcaster or anything, if you get successful enough to where you have a real platform, real stature, real money, always make sure there is someone around you who will say no. Who will just say, dude, no. Because it's really difficult. And I have been the person whose job it is to say no to the people I work for, and sometimes I wasn't good at it. By saying no, I mean you get these powerful, very influential, sometimes very famous people, and you just ha they have this magnetism and this cult of personality about them that you just want them to like you and you want them to accept you and maybe promote you and pay you. So everything's just awesome. Hell yes, great idea, amazing, I love it. You look so cool, I love those sunglasses, I love that commercial, it's really funny. That's easy to do, and maybe it even works, and they, you endear yourself to them. What's very difficult to do is to say, you know, I wouldn't do that. I, I, it, to pull Russ aside and be like, I, I, don't, I don't feel like, I don't, I'm not feeling these commercials. What do you mean? I, I, I'm, I'm loving it, I'm showing them how to eat the sandwich. It's coming off weird, it's coming off kind of forced, it's, it's not funny, I, I think we should walk away. And that takes major, major backbone. It's very difficult. I've not been able to do it, and sometimes I have been able to do it. And the problem is sometimes when you do that, that powerful person that you work for gets mad at you and resents you because you just told them they're not funny, and you just made them feel embarrassed and they feel like everybody's laughing at them. It happens all the time. I've seen some photo shoots. Look, the, the Kobe one from, I think it was GQ or something, where he's wearing like the white hooded sweatshirt and like he's just all very high fashion there was a recent christian mccaffrey one where he was wearing a pink scarf and like a cowboy hat and like he, he looked ridiculous ridiculous and kobe did too but you look at that and you're like there must be five people behind the camera being like oh hell yeah you look great this is so good and so fresh or maybe it's their significant other and they're just saying oh my god babe so hot you are so hot like it, you can hear them saying that if you look long enough at the pictures I look at Russell Wilson in his commercials, in his fashion choices, in his press conferences, in really all of the decision he makes in his public life, and I just hear five different people telling him how awesome it is, and how funny, and how great, and how cool, and how badass, and how famous, and just, you can hear them. And maybe he's just telling him himself that, but I, 
I don't sense anyone around him who says, you know, Russ, when we go back to Seattle for the first time ever, let's maybe chill on the lime green tuxedo, especially after the game when you lose and don't play well. I would not do that. I just, everyone says, he brings out and says, what do you think of this? And they say, hell yes. You look like a, an absolute celebrity rock star. That's the look. Too many people. This commercial, sandwiches, fine. I don't need to be told how to eat a sandwich. It's not the worst commercial I've ever seen. It's not the least funniest commercial I've ever seen. It just seems the next step in the Russell Wilson experience in which no one will tell him no, and he doesn't know what to do. So he just does everything, and it's always weird. Sometimes it's even hilarious. Let's move on. What are we going into? Are we going to brand awareness next? I have to go to the old Google Doc. I, the, the, I'm, I'm dropping parts here today. The lights are breaking. Oh, better. I thought we were going to brand awareness. Guess what we're going to next, guys? <laughs> takes on takes. Let me get my numbers. Let's go. Do you have ambitious hiring goals for the last quarter of 2022? With a powerful hiring partner, big goals are no big deal. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Join over 3 million businesses worldwide using Indeed to hire great talent fast. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to sponsor your job post at Indeed.com basement. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com basement. Need to hire? You need Indeed. All right, you know how this works. We have two combatants. We have been watching, listening, and um, writing down all the takes that have come out today, this morning, maybe it was yesterday, as we just cruise into what we call the best month in the sports calendar. That is October. Lots of takes out there. We pair the two take artists against each other. I give them a rating, and we'll see who wins. First up, ESPN's Get Up. And Marcus Spears. Okay, Marcus Spears has been in there before. Uh, one previous appearance, he got a six, and he lost to Richard Sherman. So let's see if the big man can get up here. Uh, Marcus Spears, here he is after being asked, Marcus, who is Russell Wilson this year? He is Drew Lock 2.0. Is what Whoa. he is right now. Whoa. And they were ah. trading for Russell Wilson. And all of the talk that we had leading into this season with Denver and getting Russell Wilson, the AFC West is going to be the best division in the history of the league. And now we get this version of Russell Wilson. And I keep hearing people say, like, this is what Seattle knew. Seattle ain't know this. Seattle ain't think Russell Wilson was going to be this bad. You pay $240 million <laughs> for your quarterback to overcome some of those things. And Russ is just not doing it. Russ ain't cooking. He ain't making hibachi. He ain't making appetizers. <laughs> he ain't making nothing. This 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 looks this looks so bad. This looks so bad. And think about this, guys. A Russell Wilson led Denver Broncos team just got beat by a hurt kicker. By who? What? What did he just say? A hurt kicker. <laughs> All right, I, I didn't miss that. All right, so maybe I might have stumbled at the finish line with Marcus Spears. But that was good. You come out real clean with the Drew Lock 2.0. Drew Locke's sitting somewhere and be like, what did I do, man? Come on. Sorry, Drew. Drew gets Drew takes a lot. Um, and then I do like the part about cooking. Now, the Russell Wilson cooking thing is very tired, as we know. But I like he had a fresh take on it, that he's not making hibachi. He's not making appetizers. I bet Marcus Spears can clean up at the hibachi, too. I did hibachi, like, last Sunday night, like, five, six days ago. It's an undefeated activity. I'm almost tempted to do a quick sidebar on it, but I won't. You don't go to hibachi and be like, yeah, that kind of sucked. It's always awesome. It's always salty. There's always fire. There's always drinks. Kids like it. Grandparents like it. It's one of the great activities you can do. I really mean that. I don't think it's overrated. I like the food, too. People say the food's crap. You're crap. I like it. Bowling is always fun. Live sporting events is always fun. Live music and hibachi. Benihana. So I like that part of it. Um, and I like the take. I think it's good. It was, it was, I liked it. It wasn't too long. He had some humor. He had some aggression. He had some football. 
the Drew Locke thing, I, I kind of lost, they lost to a hurt kicker. I think he, I mean, he probably should have said injured kicker. It would have been a little clearer. But I'm not going to take that much away from him. I'm going to give the big man a solid, hold on, a solid seven here. I wish I could put together some onion slices and put some oil in it, light it on fire and make a volcano. Or a beating heart with the rice, with the spatula, or the train. Or I would throw up a, a piece of uh, zucchini and then catch it in my chef's hat. Oh, man. You think I can't hit a free throw on the show? I can't. You should see me catching the, the zucchini. He flips at me. I'm like a seal catching a fish or kelp or whatever it is. I am the Jerry Rice of catching zucchini at the, at the hibachi. And I bet Marcus Spears is good, too. So he's going to catch a seven here. So who can take him out? Who do we got? We got Stephen A., the usual Michael Irvin. No. No, this is, this is really cool. Stepping into the ring is... Uh, a gentleman from a, a different era than Marcus Spears, than myself, but a guy who I've watched, read for 25 years, Michael Wilbon, all right? Michael Wilbon appears via remote on Get Up, and he's asked about the Lakers, the LeBron, AD, Westbrook, Lakers, and check out Wilbon, what he's got to say about even talking about the Lakers. Go ahead. I think they're more really good teams in the NBA to start a season to, yes, last night than I think I've ever seen in my lifetime at one time. The Lakers are not one of them. And I just hope that we are not held hostage on Countdown or whatever else we're doing on this <laughs> network, your show and Stephen A's and mine, to talk about the Lakers every day because some of us aren't going to get into this hand-wringing. I'm not, except when you guys <laughs> shove me into it, which I'm sure we will tonight. <laughs> They're not good enough to have this hand wringing all year. A lot of people around the country are going, really? Really? We and we do want to see LeBron. We want to see LeBron play. I love watching him still in this 20th season. But don't tell me the Lakers and the all Knicks right. are going to headline right, anything. All right, so I, I, this is personal to me. I love this. I love it. Because Will Bond is a made guy who's been around the block, who can say, do, and opine on anything he wants. And he has asked the Lakers question, and he takes the opportunity to make it a little more existential, and to talk media, and to talk business. And that was a none too subtle way of saying, I don't care, and I, I'm not gonna do this. The Lakers are not that good, they're not worthy of us talking about. There's a lot of other good teams, and we're talking about them because of their star player and because of their logo and because of their history. That's why. So he's out there saying, I hope we are not forced into a whole year of this BS where we're talking about a team that's not that good, that we know is not going to win the title, and yet we have to do it because they're the company and we think there's some metric somewhere that say our ratings will be higher if we talk about the Lakers instead of the teams that are actually objectively better and in personally, think, I think, more interesting. So I hope we're not going to do that on this show, and this show, and this show. I love that take. I love it because I identify with that take personally. I've had that take. It's been about the Dallas Cowboys, and it's usually an off-season thing. I've talked about the Cowboys a lot on the basement, a lot on Good Morning Football, because they have a really good record, and in a meritocracy sense, like they've earned it, and they've been winning, and they should be talked about. But in the off-season, and certainly in training camp, you get these... Exe executives, you get these segment producers, you get these showrunners who they assemble their show, and God bless them, I, I live and work with so many of them, and they say, well, how should we start this hour of the show? How should we start the show? Well, you know, the, um, the Bengals look really good, and uh, I think uh, this team, you know, the Eagles might be good, and you know, the, the Panthers are kind of interesting. They got a new quarterback, and no, 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 we, we can't do that. We can't. Let's just start with the Cowboys. Whoa, Cowboys, they, they, they blow it every single year. They haven't won a Super Bowl in 27 years. It's a little bit tired. Like, why don't we talk? No, just talk Cowboys. People want to hear Cowboys. I don't think people do want to hear Cowboys. My take on that is, is it's similar to Wilbon's on the Lakers. Why? Why? Because they were good in the 90s? Because they have a cool star and they sell a lot of merchandise? My take on the Cowboys has always been there was a time when they would spike ratings, so to speak, 
and just talk Cowboys and you're fine. I think media has changed. I think the Cowboys have changed. I think they blew up and had a massive ascension in the mid-90s when NFL ratings were skyrocketing and media deals were skyrocketing and the timing was perfect. And just throw Troy and Mike and Emmett and Jerry and Jimmy and everyone will watch. I don't think that's there anymore. I really don't. I think he consumed media differently. I don't think people are saying, oh, hell yes, the Cowboys. I think actually there's a nausea for the Cowboys and a nausea for the Lakers and a nausea for the Yankees if they're not good, which they are now. But if they're just being talked about in a vacuum, I think people actually change the channel. I don't think they stay. I really don't. So I'm in a kind of a quandary here with takes on takes where I identify with Wilbon's take. It doesn't fit the usual categories we go with the takes on takes, which is delivery, uh, originality, and heat, or does it? The delivery is excellent. The heat is excellent because the heat comes from him actually calling out his own employer editorially, which I like. And certainly the originality is there because no one else is doing it. And you got a bunch of like, what I like about it is you got some, some basically some lifers sitting there at the desk. You got Greenberg, ESPN, Stephen A, ESPN, and then Saturday, who, who's been a, a fixture since he retired. And so they're like, they kind of know what's up. And they're not doing it. But they probably feel the same way. Why are we talking about the bleeping Lakers? So I'm going to do it. I'm going to give Mike Wilbon an 8. And my respect for what you say sometimes as breaking the fourth wall. Or pulling back the curtain on editorial TV production. And saying, just so you know, this is we game one of the season. I'm not sitting here all year and talking about an average Lakers team. I'm talking to the audience, but I'm also talking to my bosses right now. Don't pull me into it. I'm not doing it. I'll talk about interesting, better teams. I've given that speech before. I recognize that speech, and I gave him an eight. Marcus Spears, it's just like your stock, really strong football take. This one was a little more sophisticated. And listen, it's my show. It's my segment. I can pick whoever I want. I like that one more. Mike Wilbon, welcome to Takes on Takes. Finally. Uh, uh, a career moment for you, my friend. That's it. That's takes on takes. Let's move on, though, to another one where we're going to do all kinds of headlines. Our guy Michael Flynn in something we call Brant Awareness. Let's go. Hello, Flynn. It's been a hell of a show. I broke one of the lights, and then I fixed it in the middle of the segment, and um, we had all kinds of stuff going on. Are you enjoying today's Kyle Brant's Basement? I'm enjoying today's Kyle Brandt's basement. I prefer if you didn't wreck any more of the set, so I don't have to <laughs> head over there. But uh, so far, so good. Yes. <laughs> well, listen. There was a time when someone had to head over here 26 times in a nine-day period. So we're on a hot streak of not having anybody heading over here, and I'll just continue that. Why don't you head over to a headline or two? And what do we got? What do we miss? Let's do it. Uh, The holidays will be here before you know it, and there's nobody jollier than the Philadelphia Eagles right now, sitting at 6-0, heading into the bye. And yesterday, Jason, Kelsey, Jordan, Mylotta, and Lane Johnson announced they'll be releasing a Philly special Christmas album this holiday season. Kyle, are you listening, and are you a Christmas music guy? Well, shoot, that's that's two big different questions. Yeah. And maybe we'll do the Kyle Brandt's Basement Christmas special uh, down the road. Big, big, big Christmas music guy. Yeah. And it's not Christmas season for me until I put on the Neil Diamond Christmas album. rap a pum pum rap a pum pum I love it. But now I'm watching Lane Johnson and Jason Kelsey and my man, Jordan Maialata from Down Under. And they're in a recording booth. It looks like they're, they're doing the Do They Know It's Christmas which is my other favorite Christmas song. This is great. They have the Philly Christmas special album, and it's a knockoff of the Peanuts album, which is excellent. It's an homage. They have a saxophone. They have someone drinking Gentleman Jack, which, if you know, is like the classier version of Jack Downs. Not quite the single barrel, but it is the Gentleman Jack. And then Kelsey just belting it out. I do like this a lot. Um, in all the optics, I enjoy but also... Kelsey's beloved, he, he is, he's really like one of these Philadelphia sports icons. That's the phrase that's always gets used. But he will always be looked back on, Lane too, but Kelsey because of the speech and the, and the rocky steps and because he's the center and he's just been there so long, people will buy it, people will like it. And here's the most important part. We've seen some terrible, terrible athlete albums, all right? Like, you, you can look it up. Dwight Howard once did a children's album in which he just sang like Smash Mouth songs. Look it up. 
Dwight Howard recorded the song All Star by Smash Mouth and some other ones. It's very strange. Dwight had a weird phase there for a while. But uh, Jordan Mailata, who is the massive, massive, I don't know what he is, 6'8", 340 or something, Australian tackle, who is a former Australian Rollins football player in the international pathway and all that, and then now he's like a made guy and has a huge contract. He can really sing. If you didn't know that, if you just type in Jordan Mailata singing, he can really belt it out, like a beautiful singer. So Kelsey and Lane will handle like the meat-headed portion of it, and then Mailata will come in and do the melodic part. It's a little bit, again, like the band-aid, do they know it's Christmas. I wouldn't say it's all the best singers in there, but like Boy George crushes. George Michael is unbelievable. I've had this long debate with, uh, with an old friend of mine, Jason Stewart, who is a fixture in sports media and has worked everywhere and is a friend of the basement. And he always says that um, Boy George is the real grace in the opening of that song. And I always say it's George Michael. I think I like him better. But we'll have to find out. I want to get the album. I'd, I'd love to play the album. I'd love to listen to it. My lot is going to be the best singer. The question, the Boy George versus George Michael conversation is going to be Lane Johnson versus Jason Kelsey. Who has the better voice? But I'm into it. it why not ask this in October? Flynn, what's your favorite uh, Christmas song around that holiday time? I have to be, I'm a huge Christmas music guy. I'm shocked that you are too. I wasn't expecting that out of you. Uh, I think the my generation goes with uh, Mariah Carey's All I Want for Christmas is You. Sure. But my favorite is uh, Darlene Love, I believe back by the E Street Band, uh, All Alone mm. on Christmas. It's a good one. You got to listen to that. I got to listen to Neil Diamond. I didn't know he had one. He's got two albums, and uh, I, E Street Band, I think of Bruce, and he does it, Merry Christmas, baby! Like, they, I, I know all the songs, Flynn. Like, if you're, I, I'm almost insulted that you're surprised that I like country music. I, I love this stuff. We'll, we'll have a great December here in the basement, but in the meantime, it's October. We're supposed to be debating, like, Snickers or Milky Way. What else is uh, in the headlines that we should be made aware of? Yeah, a more imminent holiday. Your guys, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, yep. uh, posted a picture on social media Tuesday of them carving pumpkins together with, of course, giant knives. Kyle, you got to love this. Yeah, I, I, it makes me really happy. These are my guys. Th those two gentlemen have given me so much enjoyment, so much satisfaction over the years. And let me just break this down. And this is why if you're listening to Kyle Brand's Basement as a podcast, God bless you and thank you. You really got to watch on YouTube because you should see the visual I'm looking at right now. All right. So in a very Freudian photograph, we have Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger, both with big smiles right next to each other, carving pumpkins. And they've got the jack-o'-lanterns. But each of them has massive, a massive knife. And it's a little tough to tell, but both of them, listen, um, Sly obviously was kind of the face of knives in the 80s, and he's got a Rambo knife. And then you got Arnold, and I assume this is at Arnold's house because there's a photograph of Arnold flexing behind them. It wouldn't shock me to know that Sly had a, a, a painting of Sly flexing, but it's probably Arnold's house. And yet Arnold also has this massive knife, which reminds me of the one that he stocks like on his gear in his classic suit up scene in 1986's Commando. It's just so great to see them together. At this point, those guys are really getting up there and look, the odds are against having both of them still even here with the lives they've put themselves through and the, you know, the, the ways that they've held up their bodies. It makes me very happy to see it. And I'll, I'll just give you my take again. Um, Sylvester Stallone it was really the face of knives in the world. If you, if you think about that, even in that late 80s time, there was nothing cooler than having a huge knife. Um, obviously, in Rambo, we talked about that. The knife is a character of itself. Then he goes with Cobra, which we've talked about in this show a lot, in which the Night Slasher has a knife with spikes on the handle. And that was really big. Um, also, switchblades, very cool at the time, like in all movies and they would have a switchblade that would come out, and then in a Michael Jackson video, there's a switchblade. Uh, the Crocodile Dundee, that's not a knife, that's a knife. Like that's it, it, Knives were so hot back then. And this is kind of after lightsabers, but the knives were big. So I like seeing those guys with the knives out, and I love that they just got them there. I, I got a feeling those aren't the only two things those guys have compared in their private time at some point. They have a long history 
long where they used to be a rivalry and they'd poke fun at each other. But if you are a certain age, I'm going to say if you are between the ages of like 38 and 55, that's like, that's Uncle Sly and Uncle Arnie. And you just, it makes you happy just to see them. And I just, I imagine them going to each other's houses and it's you son of a, even though it's not Carl Weathers. Like I just, it makes me, I can't tell you, sometimes my wife will send me a picture of my kids and they're going down the slide or they're holding up an art project or they made a goal. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. None of that stuff makes me as happy as seeing Uncle Sly and Uncle Arnie with their massive knives carving pumpkins and having a smile. So uh, thank you for that, Flynn. I, I, I'm going to go back and look at that on my private time, too. Just reflect on it. I love it. <laughs> I love it, too. Let's head uh, back to football. You mentioned the quarterback intrigue at the top of the show. The slate of games this weekend isn't anywhere near what it was last weekend. Is there one yeah. game that stands out to you? Yes, yeah, the weirdest thing. I, I, I've never said this sentence before in my entire life. I'm going to say it, though. <clears throat> I'm really looking forward to Bengals Falcons. <laughs> Has that sentence ever been said by anybody, including members of the Bengals and Falcons over the years? I don't know if it has. Like, I, I'm trying to think of a time when both those teams have mattered. I don't even know if they matter now. They're both three and three. I just like the game. I like the matchup because uh, you have the Bengals who are just trying to stay afloat after the Super Bowl run, and then you have the Falcons who are really trying to become something, and they've had an interesting season in which they play really hard, and they were screwed by the Grady Jarrett call, and like, I don't know, I just like the way they play. They kind of remind me of, of how some of these Titans teams are that are just resilient, and it's, you know, their coach used to be with the Titans. So I, I'm trying to think of a time when both those teams have mattered, an era even. Like, was there Carson Palmer era Bengals teams versus maybe young Matt Ryan teams that played meaningful games? I don't know. And then, you know, Boomer Esiason was his Bengals teams were the Falcons good that I, I maybe and I, certainly that I can't remember it. So it's fun to say out loud. If the, if one of these teams gets to four and three, they're fine. Four and three teams are right in the mix. Three and four seems like, even though it's a dip, well, game difference, it feels like a huge difference. So I started the show by saying this is tough. This is Bush following corn at Woodstock 99. Week seven of the NFL following Bill's Chiefs last week is a tough follow. And yet, you better believe it. We'll do a show Sunday night. I'm talking about the Falcons if they win that game. I did a whole bit, the cricket bit. Oh, you want to talk Falcons? Listen. No one wants to hear it. Believe you. I'm going to run through the crickets. I'm going to stomp the crickets. If they win, I'm talking about it. The Bengals win, I'm talking about it. Flynn, not the prettiest thing. If this were the 31 flavors, there's not a lot of delicious choices here. But do you have a favorite game on the schedule this week? I, I do. And I'm going to go with my Jets. And it's the first time that I've referred to them as my Jets in about my Jets. 10, 10, 10 years. But last year, the story was always Zach Wilson, even when he was mm -hmm. hurt. The story yeah. was, look at what Joe Flacco and Mike White and Josh Johnson are doing, and can he learn from what they're doing well with the offense? Yeah. We really haven't seen that yet this year, and he hasn't been the story, but this weekend, playing in the Denver air, I expect him to air it out, mm -hmm. and I think the question is whether he's going to air it out smartly at, or rely on his receivers who can now be explosive and make plays sure. and get that offense going. It's it's the, the expression that's popular now is if this season is going to keep going and they're going to keep winning at some point Zach Wilson needs to enter the chat you know like we we you can't as a quarterback in this era of football just be like yeah you know I threw for 130 and no picks like at some point you got to give me 250 you got to go win a game I don't know if he has I don't know if he can I, I have no idea Zach Wilson might not be good he might not or like he he might be electric and he's just waiting for the moment but the more we get along here week after week after week, if he doesn't start doing crazy things, it, the probability is that he is not great. In other words, the great ones will show it before long. And I'm talking about in this era, Herbert immediately, immediately, first game. Mahomes, immediately, first game. Josh Allen, I'm talking about starting that game against the Vikings, he's jumped over Anthony Barr, they won the game. It didn't take long. So you got these other guys who are really talented in this young era right now, like, you know, Justin Fields, uh, <laughs> Daniel Jones, we've just, we're kind of waiting. You know, Kyler has done some pretty cool things. So the, the way that the systems now and the offenses are set up, 
the guys who have it have it quickly. You don't sit on the bench for two years typically and then come out and say, now I'm ready. So in other words, what I'm saying is Zach Wilson, it's go time. It's getting a little weird if he just kind of sits around and doesn't do much. Now he was hurt to start the season. Okay. But you're not hurt anymore. A few games back. I think it's go time. Is that accurate, Flynn? And is there anything else? Did we just finish the show? That's accurate, and we just finished the show. J-E-T-S. Awesome. J-E-T-S. I like that it's now my Jets. It's, it becomes a possessive, <laughs> and I totally get it. Um, Flynn also usually helps me with the uh, final topic. So here we go, Flynn. I have one dart left. You're going to tell me whatever it is. The producers, Flynn, of course, being operative in that, comes up with 20 random topics. Whatever number, let's go here. Whatever number I hit on that dartboard off yonder... We'll go to that topic number, topic six, topic 13, whatever. And then I'll just ad lib something as I go right on the Peloton. Don't know what the topics are. Don't which one I'll get. Here we go. Look how sharp that sucker is. These are real darts. I tell my kids all the time, don't go in there and play with them. You'll put your eye out like Ralphie. Here we go. That is a clean 14, guys. 14. It's a black strip about 10 o'clock. Hangover remedy. Is what is What is a hangover remedy? Well... It's funny you should ask because I was just in Memphis and the state of Mississippi as the best man of my younger brother's bachelor party. So, kind of an interesting deal. A lot of people were looking for him, and there is a large age gap at this particular bachelor party. My brother-in-law is actually two years older than me, so he's probably, I think he's 45, And then the groom and his crew are all 31, 30, maybe 32. So that requires many different types of needs in terms of recovering from alcohol. Now, my brother-in-law, the the patriarch, the oldest one, he showed up with this incredible, like, medicine kit of this little pouch that supposedly has, like, the IV liquid in it that you just drink. And then there's these vitamins and these all kinds of things. He had a whole kit. Like, he had a salad bar of over-the-counter CVS stuff that he purchased that he thought was going to help him recover. And I, I think it probably did. And then the other guys, they're just, like, they're, they're still 31. They're still young. They're just, like, best best remedy for a hangover is, like, just a cold Coors Light at 6.30 in the morning, Just which I just can't get there. My deal has always been two things. If I'm on a bender and, it, like, it's always preemptive. I don't really think there is a good hangover cure. So it's a little bit of a cop-out answer. My greatest cure is always sidestepping the hangover. So two things. If I'm out and I have like a a big drink night, I have five, six, seven drinks, whatever it is, and I get back and I'm like, oh, I'm totally messed up. I do this weird thing where I, before I crash, I shower. I go to shower and I feel like it just kind of, kind of washes me free of the sins and the chemicals, and the just all, I just feel a little bit more refreshed before I crash. And sometimes it's so bad, you know, like I'll, I'll try to use the soap, but like the soap, the bar soap's just on the ground, and I'm just like using my foot and like rubbing it like it's like I'm a cricket or something. <laughs> and then I crash. But before I crash, I always, always pound like a giant thing of Gatorade or G2 or something with that like carbs and electrolytes so that it sits in your system and works into the system as you sleep. Um, Once you wake up, I don't really have one. I go to Denny's, I guess. I just eat 50 slices of pizza. But shower before you pass out, and earlier in the day, you know, when you're going through your errands and you're sad or whatever, buy a huge Gatorade, chug the entire thing before you pass out. It's the only thing I got for you. I wish I had my brother-in-law's salad bar, but I don't know what the hell that stuff was. I think it worked for him, though. This worked for me, guys. Thank you for joining me. We will be back Sunday night to review all the red-hot Bush at Woodstock 99 Week 7 action. Until then, like, subscribe, follow, rate, review, blah, blah, blah. You're the best. Thank you. See you. Love you. See you next time.